Welcome to the Revenge Story Times channel. On a bench made of marine teak wood and iron overlooking Lake Riff, freshly restored and cleaned, Lewis sat and reminisced. This bench, donated by the Edmonds family from Mozick in memory of their beloved grandfather Kenneth Edmonds, had seen many happy times. Inscribed on a freshly polished brass plaque, it read, This bench is for everyone to enjoy the beauty of the area he loved so much. As a native, Lewis read the inscription and let out a brief, sharp, and bitter laugh. He knew why old Kenneth loved this spot, especially this lookout where the bench was strategically placed in his honor. From here, Kenneth would often sit and gaze wistfully at the crystal-clear blue water that had submerged his childhood home several decades ago when the Tacoma City Light Company built the Mossy Rock Dam to generate electricity for the city. Lewis knew that the town of R was somewhere down there, now lying 60 meters below the shimmering surface of the lake, which currently reflected the magnificent blue sky and scattered clouds. Under the forest canopy, various native pines grow, surrounding the lake. Some of the western white and ponderosa pines soared into the sky, reaching heights of over 36 meters in his childhood, Lewis always dreamed of climbing to the top of one of them to see if he could touch the endless sky. He had a cherished memory of his late father, once, when he was a small boy, he and his father lay on their backs by the lake, resting. Their old bamboo fishing rods were propped against a tree, set for salmon which thrived in these waters. They looked up at the sky, admiring the astonishing work of nature. While resting, he told his father about his desire to climb to the top of one of the pines. His father remained silent for a few minutes, not even acknowledging Lewis's statement. Just when Lewis thought that his father must have missed his words entirely, he started humming a line from a song, Forgive me while I kiss the sky. His father was a terrible singer, he couldn't carry a tune to save his life, but that never stopped him from singing. As his father's voice repeated the line, teenage Lewis glanced around awkwardly, praying that no one else would witness the singing. However, in adulthood, that moment became a fond and indelible memory. Both of Lewis's parents were lost to cancer when he was still very young. That fact, along with his understanding of genetics, became one of the reasons for this meeting. Life is too short. Now, Lewis's attention was drawn to the lake itself. Nearly 23 miles long, it was so deep that no light could penetrate the darkness enveloping the once bustling, tight-knit community of R. The darkness hid all traces of its existence, as it would never again be visible in the light. Lewis considered this a fitting metaphor for his marriage. To any passerby unfamiliar with the nightmare that Lewis had been living in recent times, it might have seemed like he was peacefully soaking in the solitary beauty of the warm autumn weather that occasionally visited the Pacific Northwest. The locals still refer to this phenomenon, despite its current political incorrectness, as Indian summer. When it arrives, there is no more beautiful time or place on earth. It almost makes the nine long months of dreary rain seem bearable. Although Lewis appeared calm on the outside, inside he was in turmoil. He had to go through this nightmare alone. He was an only child and he didn't have many friends outside of the fire station. Lewis couldn't talk to any of the guys at the station about his problems because, unlike how they are portrayed on television, firefighters don't spend all their free time sharing their fears and emotions or discussing intimate moments with their comrades. No one dares show weakness in front of others, fearing that they might lose trust, their lives depend on each other. Even a moment of hesitation caused by uncertainty about whether they can trust someone to act correctly in extreme situations could prove fatal. No, in this, Lewis was completely alone. He had deliberately arrived earlier because, truth be told, he was counting on the healing power of his beloved lake and the magical natural bomb of nature to help him get through this meeting, requested by his soon-to-be ex-wife. She actually demanded it, and his lawyer said it would be in his best interest to grant the request. It will look good in family court, his lawyer advised. Besides, his lawyer was increasingly frustrated by Bland's constant attempts to create obstacles to delay the inevitable. Lewis couldn't understand why Blaine continued to insist that their marriage could survive her madness. She wanted her lawyer to demand mandatory counseling. It didn't matter to her that, in the state of Washington, a family court judge couldn't order it. Both lawyers had tried in vain to reason with Blaine, but to no avail. Lewis thought that Blaine definitely needed some kind of therapy, but that was no longer his concern. 
Well, he mused to himself, today it will all end anyway. Blaine might have requested the meeting, but Lewis insisted on the location. He knew that the summer crowds were now just a distant memory, so most likely the place would be theirs alone. This meeting would not go the way Blaine expected. He cast a brief glance at his watch. She was supposed to arrive in a few minutes, but he knew he actually had plenty of time. On the one hand, Blaine would have to drive a considerable distance on Highway 12, which she absolutely hated. She was never on time for anything, including their wedding. She was an hour late for that. He let out the same cynical chuckle as the memory of it quickly came to mind. He thought he should have left the church after the 20-minute delay, as his best man had jokingly suggested more than 13 years ago. But he quickly dismissed the thought. The truth was, the first 12 and a half years of his marriage to Blaine had been like a perfect dream. Lewis loved his two daughters, Renee and Lacey, more than life itself. Rain, as she was called, was a daddy's girl through and through. She was already studying and preparing to become a firefighter, just like her adored father. On the other hand, Lacey was a mini-me of his wife. For Lewis, this was just one of many challenges. Family courts don't like to separate children from their parents. This, along with the fact that, in Washington state family law, there is no set age allowing a child under 18 to choose which parent to live with during a divorce. However, according to his lawyer, not all hope was lost. Despite the difficulty, Washington's divorce and child custody laws allow a husband and wife to jointly present a parenting plan to the court. If the judge finds the plan detailed, comprehensive, and financially fair for the children, they usually sign it without changes. The trick, his lawyer told him, was to get his wife to agree to the very complicated proposal that Lewis wanted her to accept. Lewis was a realist, even before his lawyer confirmed it, he understood that his job as a firefighter in the Riverside Fire Authority, known as RFA, would almost certainly prevent him from gaining primary custody of his daughters. The dangerous nature of the job and the rotating work schedule were nearly insurmountable obstacles when considering custody arrangements. It took time and money, lots of money, to develop the plan he put into action. He closed his eyes and mentally returned to that awful day several months ago when his nightmarish existence began. He still couldn't decide if his current life was an episode of The Twilight Zone or the movie Groundhog Day. His reality was both surreal and horrifyingly repetitive. Lewis, honey, can we talk in the living room, please? He had just finished his pleasant night ritual of putting the girls to bed in their shared bedroom when he heard her voice. Though he needed sleep, as his next 24-hour shift started early the next morning, he was eager to talk to his wife. He hoped Blaine wanted to continue discussing their shared desire to buy their own house. The four of them lived in a rented three-bedroom apartment, and they were both eager to finally purchase a home of their own now that their careers were secure. They had agreed that it would be much better to raise their daughters in their own home, as it provided more stability. On his way to the living room, he stopped by the kitchen and grabbed a bottle of water from the fridge. He sank down onto the worn-out sofa, inherited from his parents, and turned toward Blaine. Crossing his right leg over his left, so he was facing her, for a moment he gently tousled her loose blonde hair, which always covered her ear, then carefully tucked it behind her ear and rested his hand on her shoulder. How are you, honey, he asked. After that, he remembered very little. His memories of their conversation were mostly fragmented, like piercing stabs to the heart in a kaleidoscope of shock, disbelief, and anger. However, his reaction remained crystal clear. Even months later, he was still embarrassed by how shockingly weak and emotional his response had been. He cried. He actually cried in front of her. It was so pitiful that he could feel Bland's pity for him. Stumbling, he left the house and walked away from the source of his torment. One good thing about being a firefighter is that there's always a free bunk to sleep in. No one ever asked questions about his constant presence. Everyone knew the divorce statistics in the profession. A few days later, he managed to piece together what his wife had told him. She hadn't asked for permission, she had simply stated what she was going to do. When he finally returned home, he planned to beg his wife not to tear their family apart. He was ready to plead with her to go to counseling with him, to find a way to save their marriage. 
But before he could even start, he was ambushed by his loving and innocent daughters. Elaine had promised him they would meet at her parents' house. He turned and looked at his wife, who stood there with a sly, victorious smirk on her face. The love he once felt for her had long since vanished. In its place had come a burning hatred. He looked at Blaine, and his usually calm face twisted with rage, bordering on murderous intent. For a moment, her look of superiority faded, replaced by fear. But it was at that very moment that his daughters began to attack him in their blissful ignorance. They begged him to explain why he was abandoning them. He had to literally tear himself away from Rain and Lacey's desperate embraces as they pleaded, screamed, and cried. Rain was the hardest. Dad, how will I ever become a firefighter without you? He knew that this scene would replay in his mind over and over until the day he died, no matter the outcome. However, Lewis also knew that the alternative for his girls, in the long run, would be far worse. In the end, he was grateful to Blaine. In a single moment, he transformed from a weak victim into a man whose path was clear. One fine day, Lewis silently thanked her. He regained his dignity and took the first step toward recovery. Today, he thanked her. I know this is hard for you, girls, and I hope one day you'll understand. It's just that your mom and I have grown apart. We want different things in life, but I promise you, I will never abandon you. I will see you often and love you forever. He didn't look back at Blaine even once when he finally freed himself from his daughter's embrace. He purposefully walked out of the apartment for the last time. From that day on, Lewis hadn't spoken a single word to his soon-to-be ex-wife. Wisely, he let his lawyer speak for him. Lewis didn't know whether he had dozed off or become so lost in his thoughts that he simply lost track of time. Hello, Lewis. Thank you for meeting me. Our daughters miss you very much. Her voice, which had once been a comforting and caring greeting, now grated on his mind like nails on an old chalkboard. He shook his head to clear his thoughts. It was time for the show. My lawyer told me to do this. Blaine, in a perfect world, I'd never have to look at your ugly face again. He didn't even glance in her direction. He kept his eyes fixed on the lake, drawing strength from its calm familiarity. He heard her gasp in shock. Yes, she thought this meeting would go differently. Lewis involuntarily smiled and looked at her. I know this is on your agenda, Blaine, but I need to tell you something before you start. This is our last conversation on the subject. If you repeat even one of those ridiculous reasons you've said over and over, claiming it will somehow make our marriage stronger, if you tell me again how much you love me, if you say that it's just my fragile male ego getting in the way, or even hint that I'm the one responsible for destroying the family, I will get up and leave immediately. Right now, you disgust me so much that I feel physically sick just being in your presence. Lewis, I, I, I don't know. Lewis was certain Blaine was about to repeat her nauseating line, but I love you both, and he raised his hand toward her face. Let me save you the trouble, Blaine. See this? He pointed to the large ever-present manila envelope on the bench beside him. These are the divorce papers that will officially end our marriage. When you leave here in a few minutes, you'll take them with you. You'll sign them after your lawyer reviews them. You'll return them to my lawyer's office within 36 hours. He turned away from her to admire the breathtaking view once again, then continued. My lawyer will confirm that everything here meets the state's requirements for a parenting plan, but I don't want, and I don't want a cheating wife. So, in the end, we're both getting a divorce. Now, pay attention because this is important. Lewis sighed in frustration, though deep down he knew Blaine would make things even more complicated than they needed to be. The parenting plan is what the family court focuses on the most. What I'm proposing is fair. We don't have many savings, so everything else will be split equally. You'll have custody of the girls. What? You're not going to fight me for that? Blaine scoffed. Of course not. The girls need their mother, and despite being a lousy wife, you've been a decent mother, so no, and you'll keep the apartment so the girls won't have to change schools or make new friends. 
I'll cover half the housing costs and pay more than the minimum required for child support. I'll also have plenty of visitation with my girls. It's all outlined here. At that moment, a flood of emotions rushed through Bland's mind. She felt surprised, relieved, and disappointed all at once. She had hoped that Lewis's love for their daughters would keep him at home and save their marriage. It was in that moment that Blaine began to realize what she had truly lost, and she started crying in earnest. Listen, Blaine. The reality is that, with my work schedule and the risks involved in my job, I know I don't stand a chance at getting custody of the girls, even if you were having sex with the entire football team on the 50-yard line during halftime of a playoff game. It wouldn't change that fact. D but Lewis, can't we, don't interrupt, Blaine. We're getting to the most important part. You should pay very, very close attention to what comes next. He squinted impatiently at her, pulled a thick, letter-sized envelope from his pocket, and handed it to her. She opened it and began to glance through its contents. As I said, if the divorce papers aren't signed and on my lawyer's desk exactly as written within 36 hours, every member of your family, your colleagues, your manager, and everyone else you've ever known will receive a copy of what's inside. This is your copy. It's a detailed, vivid report of what you did to end our marriage, and more importantly, it includes a record of what you demanded I accept to continue our marriage. It had been expensive, but it was worth every penny Lewis spent to obtain the investigator's report. I will also make sure that my daughters know exactly how and why their family was destroyed. Blaine was visibly shocked by what she saw. She couldn't believe it was true, no, it had to be a lie. Her lover couldn't be that kind of person. Lewis must be lying. To be honest, Lewis wasn't sure he had the courage to go through with it, knowing it would hurt his daughters deeply. But then again, he didn't think he would actually have to resort to this nuclear option. Besides, it could land him in jail and cost him his job. Adult content laws and retaliation were a two-pronged stick. He also hoped that her lover was exactly who Lewis thought he was and, most importantly, that Blaine was just as subservient and gullible as she seemed to be to that bastard. The key here, Blaine, is that the papers must be signed exactly as I propose. If your lawyer calls mine and says, my client and I, or if even a single comma, period, or semicolon is changed, the gloves come off, and your entire world will know what a piece of trash you really are. Blaine, deeply shaken, continued flipping through the investigator report. All she could manage were incoherent sounds, sniffling, and crying throughout Lewis's monologue, shaking her head in disbelief. This wasn't supposed to happen this way. Why couldn't Lewis understand? Of course, I'm offering a service-for-service -service agreement. So, here's what I'm willing to do in exchange for your cooperation. I promise I will never speak badly of you or blame you for the breakup of our family in the eyes of my daughters. I'll even be polite to your boyfriend if we end up together at one of the girls' events. Hell, I'll even shake his slimy hand if I have to. In every way, I'll act politely and civilly, as if we just amicably decided to part ways. I'll do the same with every one of your relatives and friends. I'll even babysit the kids if you and Mr. Slippery want to take a last-minute weekend trip. In short, I'll be the best ex-husband for any cheating wife. Thank you, Louis, but all of this is so unnecessary. Cha, stop, Blaine. Never mention that piece of trash's name in my presence. Louis, he's a good guy. He's not, no, Blaine, he's not. He damned it. Let's get to the point. Whose idea was it to tell me about your relationship? His idea, Lewis. He said it wasn't right to deceive someone as good as you. Lewis let out a bitter laugh, cutting Blaine off. Nonsense, Blaine. He did it to make sure he'd get exactly the same reaction from me that you did. Has he already asked when he can move in with you? Her eyes widened along with her mouth. Lewis thought she looked exactly like one of her favorite emojis that she loved to use. Blaine remained silent. She stared at her hands, which were clenched tightly. Her posture was so rigid and fragile that it seemed as though she feared the slightest movement would turn her into a pillar of dust. That's what I thought, Blaine. It's all written in the report you're holding. Lewis said, 
jabbing his fingers toward the papers in her hands. You're not his first, and you won't be his last. His track record is right there. He's not like that. He really loves me. She spoke so quietly that Lewis had to strain to hear her pitiful words. This brought an understanding smile to his face. He exhaled slowly, and a calming peace washed over him, as if another gentle breeze from his favorite lake had touched his face. It was almost over. He knew he had chosen the right path. He understood there was a risk, but now everything was under control. He was confident that everything would fall into place the way he wanted. His voice softened significantly. Look at me, Blaine. We're almost done. It's important that you pay very close attention. She looked up at him, her tear-streaked face a mask of confusion, ruined mascara, and fear. Her perfect world had been shattered. When she finally met Lewis's gaze, she saw a stony, threatening face with eyes as black as night, piercing into her. Take care of my girls, Blaine. There are girls, she protested weakly, her timidity making it sound more like a question. No, Blaine, they're not. They're my girls. You betrayed them and discarded them just like you did to me because you're weak and can't keep your legs closed. I need you to take care of them for me, at least for a couple of years. What are you talking about? The scent of her fear was almost tangible. I will never give them up. You've already given in, you just haven't realized it yet. Either way, your boyfriend will take care of it, he said with complete seriousness. Has he already used this line on you, baby, just take a little of this? It'll make our sex so much better. Our lovemaking will be so intense you can't even imagine. All your nerve endings will be on fire. Here, just wash it down with a little bit of this? She once again looked shamefully at her hands. Soon, he'll start sharing you with his friends. Come on, baby, Justin's such a good guy. Don't you want to at least try what it's like to be loved by several men at once? Blaine slowly shook her head, still staring into the distance, muttering, he won't do that to me. He loves me. Screw you, Blaine. In a few months, that idiot will be dragging you around his favorite bars. Lewis was on fire. But here's the good news, I've got a couple more years before I finish the courses necessary to get my bachelor's degree in fire safety. After that, I can apply for the fire marshal position when Frank retires. Then I'll barely have any required hours. That should be right around the time when you start falling apart and burning out. That's when I'll file for full custody. By then, you'll probably be so high that you won't even care. You're wrong. He's not like that at all. Please, Louis, I really do love you. I love our family. Why can't you see that? No, you're the one who can't see, Lewis growled at her. You never could. Honestly, I don't think you're capable of loving anyone but yourself. I was just blinded by love for who I thought you were. I was nothing more than a convenient support for you. The girls only reinforced your control over me. When your idiot boyfriend came along with his magic tool, you played right into his hands. You threw your family away like yesterday's spoiled milk. Em, and, and maybe we, uh, we could start over, she suggested, with tears in her eyes. No, Blaine, we can't. There's nothing left to start with. Besides, you won't give him up, because then your failures as a wife, mother, and person would be on full display. No, you'll continue pretending that you and that jerk are happy and in love. You're consciously walking a path of self-destruction because you have no choice. Because if you had a choice, deep down, you would have to admit to yourself what a miserable person you are. If you dared to do a self-assessment, you wouldn't be able to live with what you discovered. Now you have no other option but to live with who you are for the rest of your pathetic life. But if I'm wrong, and you both truly love each other, I'm sure it won't be long before your magical lover starts hinting that the need to take care of the kids is getting in the way. He'll probably start with something like, why don't we just let Lewis take them more often? You won't argue with him because you won't want to give up fantastic sex. That's the same thing you told me when you said I would have to share you with that parasite. 
If he eventually threatens to leave you, after suggesting, persuading, and finally promising that he will go if you don't give the girls to me, well, then you'll be back to square one, right? He smiled at her confusion. In any case, I will win, and you will lose. It's just a matter of time, and I'm a patient guy. Lewis looked out over the azure surface of the lake again. For a moment, the breeze died down, the water was as smooth as glass in a cabinet. It was time to leave. He vowed to himself that he would come back here often with his daughters. His girls liked it here, but that wasn't enough, he wanted them to love this place as much as he did. He stood up, not because he was done with her, but because there was so much adrenaline in his body that his central nervous system wouldn't let him stay still. He needed to discuss one last important detail with her. Lewis awkwardly walked around the bench. He placed his hands on the smooth, polished teak on either side of Bland's shoulders and held her firmly. He leaned in slowly to whisper in her ear, in a quiet voice full of malice yet calm fury, tell your little jerk that if I get even a hint or a simple suggestion that he is behaving inappropriately with my daughters, I will kill him. It doesn't matter what it is. I will kill him. Tell him he won't have to sneak around or look over his shoulder for me, because I will come straight for him. I want him to realize in his final moments that it was I who put an end to his pathetic existence on this earth. The same goes for you, Blaine. His voice began to tremble, and his throat ached from the tension. The pressure of his grip intensified as adrenaline surged with each word he spat at her. You will tell him this, Blaine, with the last word, a loud crack echoed as the solid would succumb to Lewis's deadly grip. Blaine flinched sharply. Lewis looked down curiously at the shattered piece of the lattice. Was it dry rot? For her part, Blaine didn't look at him, she continued to sob and whimper, her body trembling as if she were suffering from hypothermia. Remember, Blaine, 36 hours, not 37. And now I'm leaving. He looked at his hands, his nails were broken, his hands bloodied and covered in splinters. I'm strange. It doesn't hurt at all. For a moment, he stared silently at Blaine. All he saw was an empty shell of something that once was a person. He took one last look at the surroundings, inhaled the fresh mountain air deeply, then turned and walked away. Thank you for listening until the end. See you in the next episode of Revenge Storytimes. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. Goodbye.